Hello folks and welcome back to World War II TV and this is the week we are looking at the history of South Asia's involvement and indeed Southeast Asia's involvement in World War II. So we've got a variety of shows coming up, we're talking about the Indian Navy later in the week, we're talking about Operation Jaywick, a British or Australian mission into Singapore, we're looking at South Asian heroes in World War II but today we are starting with a look at the Indian Air Force and I'm sure there are some people watching who perhaps didn't even know there was an Indian Air Force in World War II well that's the point of today's show to find out all about it so my guest is 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 talks about this all the time he's got quite prolific on Twitter and he's written a book called The Forgotten Few about the Indian Air Force in World War II so uh ks uh, naya so how are you doing we've got some audio issues that's why we started are you are you well though i'm very well thank you uh, paul and uh, you know thank you for inviting me to the to the show yeah so folks for some reason um three's uh mic is a little bit quiet so you have to maybe just turn it up a little bit and turn me down a bit turn, but i'm not really talking much today so You've, as all my guests, you provided a PowerPoint. We're going to start with that essentially, and I'll hand over to you. And when I have questions from either myself or from the viewers, I will jump in. But I've been looking forward to this one because um, it's it's just an area of the war I didn't know very much about, and I think most people don't know very much about. And it's one of those important contributions that when you add it all together, it's the understanding, which is the point of this week, that World War II was won by a huge assortment of countries from a whole lot of reasons, different backgrounds, different races, different colors. And that's why I wanted to set this week up, because there is a lot of middle-aged white guys talking about World War II, and um, it wasn't just us. That's the point. So um, there we are. I'll hand over to you, and I'll jump in with questions. Thank you, uh, Paul, again. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right. The uh, the narrative of World War II is sometimes um, uh, a little Eurocentric, and in many ways that's understandable. I mean, it was um, uh, the war was, uh, or the war as it's currently uh, recalled, uh, was quite Eurocentric. But uh, when you stop to think about it, you know, the uh, a very very large part of the war, certainly in terms of the Second World War, certainly in terms of the number of people involved. Um, was the conflict between China and Japan. And uh, that conflict actually started seven years before 1939. It started in 1932. So um, uh, there is a very large element of the war that, um, that has been overlooked. Um, specifically on the, um, uh, you know, the, the Second World War was one of the great markers of history. I mean, people who come here to uh, listen to you and, and your guest, Paul, they, they know that. Um, and when someone wants to read about it from the American or the British or even the Soviet point of view, there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of books and other sources. And there are accounts of German and Italian um, operations from German and Italian sources. But trying to find Japanese accounts or Indian accounts is actually very, very difficult. And in India, I think um, it's... Uh, Contributors to why it's difficult are that, um, uh, as some of your listeners may know, India participated um, on a fairly large scale in the First World War as well. But participation in the First World War was predicated on the granting of dominion status immediately after World War I, and that didn't happen. So there was a lot of disappointment in India. Um, and in the slide you've put up, um, I've shown... Um, uh, four Indians who actually flew with the Royal Flying Corps or the RAF uh, during World War I. This is sort of a, pro a prologue to the Indian Air Force story. Uh, there were Indians flying in the First World War. Uh, there were a few others who uh, got commissions, but they didn't make it to France or Belgium to fly. These four did. Um, and the figure on the extreme right is Indra Lal Roy, who made ace and uh, who had... Who had who, uh, achieved nine victories in the space of about two weeks and was decorated with the Distinguished Flying Cross and was unfortunately shot down, um, like so many others, in flames, uh, flying an SE-5. Uh, but that's um, uh, really a, a whole different story. So there was a, a preliminary um, in, um, in the First World... There was a preliminary involvement in the First World War, and um, Indians did distinguish themselves. Uh, but... Uh, 
Uh, at the end of the First World War, India was not granted dominion status, and that accounts for some of the political, um, uh, some of the post-independence tendency to overlook India's contribution to the Second World War. Now, between the First and the Second World Wars, uh, there were a number of reforms in the Raj government, and among them um, was uh, there was a there was a commission headed by General Andrew, Sir, General Sir Andrew Skeen, whom you see in this photograph. And uh, General Skeen made a recommendation that uh, Indians should be admitted to Sandhurst, to Cranwell, and to Woolwich. Now, this was not a proposal which, in the nineteen, in the early nineteen thirties, this was a very radical proposal. And uh, you know, you have to sort of uh, admire General Skeen for, uh, for for making that uh, recommendation, his committee for making that recommendation. And uh, the 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 proposal went through you know, a, a kind of two steps forward, one step back kind of process for um, for a few years. But eventually in 1932, in October 1932, the Indian Air Force Act was passed, which uh, the first page of which is uh, um, on the slide that you're showing. And that technically brought into being um, the body called the Indian Air Force. It still wasn't called the Royal Indian Air Force. It was called the Indian Air Force at this time. And... Um, uh, and it started with the admission of six young Indian men to Cranwell. Yeah? And, and just, just uh, to jump in a bit, Sri, for a second. Yeah, um, right in these cases, when you're talking about people getting women involved in warfare or different nationalities or races, the person who is behind it has some kind of reason. So what was his connection with India? What had he seen? Had he traveled there? Was his background there? Had He, had, he, he must have seen something there that he thought was worth harnessing so so what was his background oh yes uh, sorry i didn't uh, mention that but uh, general andrew skeen uh, general sir andrew skeen was actually the chief of the indian army the chief of imperial uh, the, i think the I, I don't know whether the word imperial was used at that time i, I can't remember it's probably in the it's in the records i'm sure uh, but he was uh, the chief of the indian army he'd served for decades in in india he'd served in the northwest frontier province he'd served in operations against afghanistan and he actually wrote a little uh, a little handbook about um, uh, about fighting the afghans uh, he wrote this back in the 1920 around 1920 i think and i'm told that when operation enduring freedom or whatever name the americans gave it uh, began um, it, it was reprinted and sold out immediately wow. in, in America. It, it was in use for many, many years. It's basically a tiny little, a, a little pocketbook um, of, um, you know, of sensible suggestions for uh, the kind of operations that were taking place in the northwest frontier province of India and in Afghanistan. I've, I've seen it, and you know, I'm not a, I'm not a sort of land warfare specialist by any no all your stuff is in the air isn't it but i mean you know i'm just jumping in again because i do that it's my show but the thing is we, we could list thousands of british army officers who'd served in india in the late 19th century early 20th century who came back from india as racist as the day they arrived in india because that's how it was back then that you know we're not going to go into that issue particularly but just because you've served in india doesn't mean your innate inherent racism has been cured because as we know the the empire system back then was very very split it was very um as you would expect even you know when you watch the old hollywood films of the 30s and the 40s the gunga din and things like that the the class system the race system it's it it, it worked it functioned and i suppose it, it it had an ability to get the job done but it wasn't exactly um equaling and and so so he must have you know he he had obviously some not unique but very very special interest in seeing that there's something more than just having indian troops or indian flyers as subservience they were equal there was a benefit to bringing them in it wasn't just to make up numbers he obviously clearly sees there's 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 um there's merit here Clearly, and uh, I think um, you know I would nuance what you say, um, Paul, about um, uh, you know the thousands of British um, uh, you know officers and NCOs who came to India and spent some time in India and went back uh, as racist as the day they arrived. I would nuance that a little and say a fair number of them went back 
with a kind of respect for, mm. um, for Indian soldiers. Now, I, I think there's a there's a very definite distinction between the Indian, uh, between um, uh, those who served in the field in uh, you know, military operations and those whose term in India was entirely in uh, uh, headquarters or um, uh, or in large uh, peacetime stations. Uh, yeah, important distinction. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I think you can you can actually see the difference in some of their memoirs. Um, uh, the, the the ones who served in rear areas and the civil servants, the British civil servants, many of them went back to um, uh, to the UK with, as you say, you know, an impression of Indians as being uh, lazy and unreliable and. Um, and and uh, you know many of those things that uh, you know would, would cause a you know uh, call firestorm in the media if they were if they were said in uh, on Twitter today, but um, many of those who served in forward areas actually went back with the greatest affection for the men mm. the Indian men they uh, uh, they they commanded and uh, you know it wasn't it wasn't a, a relationship of equals at that time certainly not. But there was a kind of uh, respect. I mean, you know, Rudyard Kipling is regarded now as uh, not very um, politically correct in so many ways. But there is a kind of affection for India that even I as an Indian can see in, in his writings. So, so I would say that um, uh, Sir Andrew was um, special in that he, he, he was probably looking 10 or 20 years ahead. A, a certain amount of pressure for reforms was already being felt, both from the, uh, you know, the Indian independence movement, as well as from some of the more far-seeing Britons mm. who worked, um, you know, in the, col uh, you know, with, with the colonies. Uh, and I think uh, Sir Andrew uh, saw a lot of that. I haven't seen, uh, you know, anything that he wrote specifically about his thinking on these lines. Uh, but I have seen a couple of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, quoted, uh, you know, sentences and paragraphs suggesting that he had a certain amount of respect for the, um, you know, for Indians who'd, you know, who, for um, Indians who'd stepped up and served, um, you know, and 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 uh, functioned way above their pay grade. Maybe maybe because their uh, commanding officer had been killed, um, or had to be taken uh, to a rear area, and uh, and an Indian had to take uh, responsibility. Mm which he wasn't formally uh, assigned to uh, so i can i can imagine scenarios like that and uh, but, but uh, be that as it may i think uh, uh, he did make the recommendation i'd love to know more about uh, why um, and um, and in 19 starting in 1931 actually um, a handful of indians started to come to cranwell and uh, the first few of them are in the uh, the first batch actually of uh, uh, six is in that um, that photograph on the left. Um, the photograph on the right, uh, the the cadet uh, seated and um, on on the right of that picture with the uh, the trophy next to him um, uh, is uh, from the second um, uh, is is uh, well he actually came six months uh, after the first batch of six, and he actually took the flying trophy, and uh, as you can see he's uh, sitting next to it. And he he um, he he later went on to become the second chief of the Indian of the post uh, independence Indian Air Force. Mm. But, uh, but um, uh, as I say, he went to he went to Cranwell and he took the flying trophy. And the fact that he was awarded the flying trophy to me says that people in Cranwell were able to see past uh, at some level. Uh, you know, the instructors in Cranwell were able to see past uh, his nationality and uh, and uh, uh, origins. And, and uh, yeah. Origins. I mean, when you look at when you look at the, the RAF in the 1930s, there is a lot of emphasis on your natural ability in the in the air. Whereas perhaps if you're in the ground forces, it would take you a long time to show your if you were a little bit better than everybody else. It's harder to demonstrate that on the ground battlefield than it is in the air. If you are a naturally gifted pilot, pilot you can probably demonstrate that to people in about five minutes. And so I suppose in that environment, if you were naturally better. You 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 could you could rise more quickly. He's certainly got that arrogant fighter pilot look. He's he hasn't come there feeling he's second class anyway. He's come there with a I'm a fighter, but you know I'm a pilot, and he's yeah. sitting with exactly the same swagger and confidence as his confident as his comrades there. So you know clearly he's he's just a flyer. That's it. I, I love the way you've interpreted that, uh, uh, Paul. Well, look at him. I mean, he's just he's you know he's he's aloof. He's he's. I mean, good. That's how. That's how. He sees, that people... as a, you know, he sees himself as a member of the elite. He's not I sitting there it. out of place. You know, he's not sitting there thinking, "I shouldn't be here. I'm not worthy of this." He's sitting there 
you know, absolutely confident. Absolutely. You know, I've made this point in a couple of other um, forums, uh, Paul, that uh, uh, aviation and in some ways seamanship are both things that demonstrate themselves very, very quickly. Yeah, so natural uh, airmanship and natural seamanship um, demonstrate themselves very quickly, and um, and so the air force and the navy in in uh, certainly in India and I and I think in Sri Lanka and a couple of other um, former colonies, uh, integration started happening much more quickly in the air force and the navy, um, and I think in um, in the air force I, I would actually add that one of the one of the big changes was that. Um, um, you know when uh, you know when the uh, when recruitment to the Indian Air Force and the, uh, this is also true of the Indian Navy, uh, when they started, uh, you know proficiency in English and a certain amount of technical um, understanding, a certain knowledge of physics and mathematics, uh, uh, were both required. And uh, you know without entering into stereotypes, one of the consequences of that was that um, the recruiting had to go beyond the normal martial races. Right? So the the army had uh, had had built up. I mean, earlier uh, uh, Indian army chiefs, uh, you know, predecessors of Sir Andrew, uh, had um, you know sort of uh, bought into the martial races theory and said we uh, you know we should uh, hire only from these um, uh, communities and these uh, um, races is really the wrong word, but they used the term martial races to describe uh, um, the the communities from which they felt the best soldiers could be. Hired. But when they started looking for English language proficiency and uh, physics and maths uh, proficiency, they had to cast the net a little wider, and they had to pick up from, um, you know, from South Indians and Bengalis, who were, um, you know, the, the the traditional Indian army officer would have considered South Indians and Bengalis um, uh, troublemakers because they were better educated generally and uh, and used to question, um, uh, you know, the authorities. Uh, but uh, so, so I think uh, casting the net wider also um, uh, made a difference for the Air Force. And uh, you, uh, you admired that uh, picture of Aspie engineer. That's Aspie in the cockpit in the uh, upper right picture here. So that's uh, that's Aspie in the in the front cockpit, and uh, and the gunner in the rear uh, cockpit went on to uh, get commissioned eventually. He was uh, he was not commissioned in the, at this stage, uh, but he went on to a commission eventually and to a you know distinguished uh, career. Um, in the Indian Air Force, so um, uh, you know, by uh, on the first of April, nineteen thirty-three, um, the uh, you know the uh, the first batch of um, uh, Indian cadets from Cranwell came back to India, and they were placed um, uh, into uh, uh, a flight of Number One Squadron, which was raised, as I say, on the first of April, probably for just for the convenience of being uh, uh, the same date as the. Uh, uh, the Royal Air Force Formation Day, and they were placed under the command of a uh, of a young fl uh, British flight lieutenant, who's in in the centre of the picture on the top left. Um, so uh, the, uh, he was at that time um, flight lieutenant Cecil Bushier, right? and um, and he was um, you know in uh, you know he was a, he was a real taskmaster. He'd been you know put there in command of the first uh, uh, the first flight of the first squadron of the. Uh, new Indian Air Force, and uh, no doubt he'd been told to, uh, um, you know, to give them, um, uh, you know, to to exercise them strongly. There are some, uh, f uh, there, there there is some uh, original writing from that period which suggests that in many ways the Indian Air Force was an experiment that wasn't intended to succeed. Right? But Cecil Bushier, he 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 was a very tough disciplinarian. He imposed very tough. Uh, uh, penalties and punishments on um, on the Indian officers and airmen uh, who came into the uh, the service um, um, in those uh, early uh, those first few years. Uh, but in retrospect, he was definitely one of those who, in the long term, helped make and build the Indian Air Force. And the Indian Air Force uh, uh, admired him greatly. And he he went on to in uh, you know by the time of the Battle of Britain, he was back in the UK. And he was actually Station Commander Hornchurch. During the during the Battle of Britain, but he does come back to India and Southeast Asia later in the Second World War, and uh, uh, we do have a photograph, another photograph of him later in the uh, among those I've uh, shared with you. So as I say, there were definitely some who didn't want the Indian Air Force to succeed, and um, um, uh, but but uh, but in the in the medium and long term, they were outnumbered by those who could see the sense in uh, what they were doing. Now, the story of um, you know, the Indian Air Force in the, the, the Second World War is, in a sense, summed up in these four photographs. I mean, they, they sort of show uh, 
the range of types that the Indian Air Force was operating. At the start of the Second World War, the Indian Air Force was still flying um, you know, Westland Wapties, the aircraft in the top left, uh, which are you know, biplanes, uh, partly fabric covered. Um, and then they went to war uh, for the first time in uh, Westland Lysenders, the, the photograph on the top right. Uh, by about 1943, they'd started operating hurricanes, and eight of the nine fighting squadrons of the Indian Air Force flew hurricanes during the Second World War. Then in, by 1945, um, you know, um, the, uh, the presence of Britons in India had actually started to come down, and so there were a lot of Spitfires, including high mark Spitfires, like the Mark 14 that you see in this photograph lying around, and the Indian Air Force snapped those up with great gratitude. So... So by the end of nineteen, by the end of the war, the Indian Air Force was flying high-performance, high-mark Spitfires. But you know, there's a lot of um, uh, nuances to that progression as well, because they weren't flying Spitfires in the role for which the Spitfire was designed. They weren't flying Spitfires for high-altitude interception, which is really where the Spitfire mm. was at. Instead, they were using Spitfires for ground attack, which yeah. they, for which they weren't really at their best. But uh, you know, they, they but but that's how the war developed. Uh, and and I don't know whether you're going to cover this later on, but Darren Little, who's a regular viewer, and his grandfather was out in Burma, so he you know understands the Far East, the Middle East, and the South Asia. But um, the caste system did that have any uh, impact it, within the Indian recruits in the Air Force? I mean, how did that manage itself? I uh, the the answer is that the Air Force tried very hard not to within the first couple of, you, you know the in the indian army uh, the different castes and the different communities actually had different messes even uh, in the same unit uh, even in the same battalion you'd have a different um, you'd have a different uh, set of cooks and um, uh, and a different mess for the uh, for the hindus and the muslims and you know there'd be no beef in the in the hindu mess and there'd mm. be no pork in the in the Muslim mess and uh, and so on, uh, but um, uh, the Indian Air Force uh, within the first year or, or so of the formation of A flight, um, and th this is this is one of the few uh, aspects for which we have some really good original source evidence. We have writings from the people who were there, and they've written that they actually did a, a, a sort of a. Um, uh, informal survey among the, uh, you know, the dozen or so Indian officers and the 40 or 50 or so Indian airmen uh, of that time and said, shall we work towards an integrated mess and completely integrated uh, uh, messing facilities? And the, there was a universal agreement to do it. So I think the, Indi the Indian Air Force and the Indian Navy did a lot to uh, integrate India um, you know, very, uh, very effectively. And the, the Indian Army worked and functioned in many ways with those communities separated. Um, and the, it's, the, there isn't anything like that in the modern Indian Army, but at that time, that's, that's how they did work. The Indian Air Force and the Navy, right from the start, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, try to integrate all communities and classes. I mean, it's by necessity, isn't it? I mean, if it, it, with, the, with the relatively small numbers, if it kept on being separate here, separate there, the, the efficiency would just fall apart very quickly. So I guess in this situation, they're realizing it is, as you say, it's an experiment, and that's come up in numerous shows, African-American troops, women, is that these things are almost set up by the powers to be to fail. So they can say, well, that was never going to work, which means the people who are part of it have to go to that extra length to make sure it does succeed. So their standards are higher. The, the, what they're ex expected of them is the benchmark is set higher and higher and higher. So in anything like this that is, you know, you've got separate messes, it's just going to... It, we, we, you say reduce that efficiency, so it's in everybody's interests to just work together, which um, is and it's fascinating. Absolutely. You're absolutely right, and it did work. And uh, anyway, so sort of moving along, I mean, those are those are fascinating points, and I can go on and on about those and about you know I, I have this view about how aviation has helped to you know it's both uh, uh, both a cause and an effect of integration. Uh, integration is both a cause and an effect of mm. um, you know of, of high technology of or higher technology. Um, involvement um, than um, uh, than than you'd see in the Indian Army. That's you know material for another discussion, maybe. Uh, sort of moving along a little. When uh, you know in 1939, seven years into uh, seven years after the Indian Air Force had been formed, uh, World War II begins. At least according to the Western Allies. Although, as I say, by that time Japan and China had been fighting each other for seven years. Uh, but when when uh, World War II broke out, because of threat perceptions. World War II initially made very little difference to the Air Force. The Indian Army was mobilized um, quite quickly, uh, 
but um, uh, the, the World War initially made very little difference to the Air Force. And the, the Raj era thinking is that the defense of India was oriented towards protecting India from Soviet hordes. At that time, pre-partition India actually had, uh, you know, was uh, uh, pre-partition India and Afghanistan were actually um, had, had a border with um, uh, with the Soviet Union, and um, the Soviet Union in those first the first year and a half of the of World War II was not an ally. They had signed a non-aggression pact with Germany, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, and um, you know there was uh, there was a genuine concern, there was a, there was a genuine threat perception that India needed to. Uh, protect itself against the Soviet Union at, um, at that stage of the war. And then in December 1941, Pearl Harbor happened. And during those first year and a half, you know, as you can see in those pictures, uh, the expansion of the Indian Air Force uh, mostly took the form of aircraft taken up from trade. Old airliners were taken up and used for maritime patrol and um, functions like that. But in October 1940, as on the next page, the first of several batches of Indian volunteers arrived in the UK, and these are <clears throat> um, these were actually these were young men who were already qualified pilots in um, some way, shape, or form. Uh, many and many of them were already flying as civil uh, pilots in India for the state governments or in some such role, but they were not military pilots. So they were scooped up as part of the Indian Air Force Volunteer Reserve. An Indian Air Force Volunteer Reserve was set up, and this is and half of the first batch of uh, of volunteers in the first. Um, course of the Indian Air Force Volunteer Reserve came to the UK, and uh, there were 25 of them. Uh, I've actually met two of them who were in their, um, you know, uh, 80s or thereabouts by the time I met them. And I've actually met the Sikh who's second from left in the in the left picture there. That is uh, later he became he became a squadron leader, squadron leader M S Puji. Um, he uh, he served and flew in India in in the UK. He completed some operation. This batch was all put through some operational training in the UK. And then went on to serve in um, uh, RAF squadrons for between three months and a year, and then came back to India. And Squadron Leader Puji came back to um, India eventually, and um, uh, you know went on to serve in India. Uh, but that batch of the, the, this batch of 24 is a little better documented than some of the later batches, and um, you know they uh, uh, they sort of uh, um, uh, went through the same um, you know OTU. Uh, as um, as many others, there's a there's a wonderful photograph which um, show a little later showing a couple of the Indians together with a bunch of Polish pilots at 56 OTU in Sutton Bridge. So they were they were there. I mean, uh, you know, uh, there's a there's a um, uh, uh, there's a Twitter and a Facebook group that calls and says we were there too, which is uh, I think made up mainly of uh, uh, South Asians resident in the UK and uh, you know. We were there too. I think is uh, is a is a very clear message. We were there in a lot of those places. We served in, um, um, you know, some key uh, RAF squadrons. Squadron leader Puji served in, uh, um, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting the squadron number, but he served in the same squadron as Pete Townsend, whose mm. um, medals have just uh, uh, gone on auction. I understand. Yeah, and at this point, you know, by post Battle of Britain, any Royal Air Force objection to foreigners kind of had to disappear because we had to throw in the Poles and the Free French yeah, and the Merchant so Navy and, everyone, and Jamaicans. Oh, you know, you look at the end of the Battle of Britain movie. So, you know, by this point, we'll take anybody who can fly an aircraft. You know, it doesn't matter what where they come from. It's desperate times now. And the fact that these are arriving, I think it's key to uh, clarify, they're arriving as qualified pilots because someone asked... Are they going through the air training scheme that's going on in Canada? Well, no, because these guys are experienced. They may have been flying old-fashioned aircraft, possibly, but they're, they're, they're flyers. So um, straight into work, essentially. You know, another tiny little bit of trivia about the diversity of the uh, of those who, um, you know, who qualified as pilots and, you know, who had those gifts to qualify as pilots. One of this first batch of 24, I mean, he came from India. Uh, he came to the UK from India. But his origins were actually in East Turkmenistan, which is now part of the, uh, you know, the, the Xinjiang region of China. Right? His father, his father had been working for one of the Indian Maharaja, had been employed by one of the Indian Maharajas. So he, uh, you know, grown up in India, uh, had a had a decent education, um, you know, uh, became a uh, became a civil pilot. And uh, uh, when the volunteer reserve uh, was opened up, he volunteered, and he came to the UK. Uh, with um, you know this first group of 24, he um, uh, he flew with a Wellington squadron of the RAF and was actually killed in action 
uh, shot down on a uh, on a raid flying wellingtons uh, you know so uh, so so I, I mean, but think of that a man from a man who today would be considered a native of xinjiang in china mm. so, so xinjiang at that time was not part of china but uh, that's a whole different term there oh there's the the picture on the left is uh, from 56 otu and uh, there's a couple of uh, indians in there but most of the others are uh, Poles. And if you look, uh, you know, one of the things, a characteristic of this picture, you can see that it's actually been printed from the wrong side of the negative. The Poles are wearing their own pilot's badge. And that's, you know, very distinctly different in yeah. shape from the RAF uh, uh, pilot's, uh, pilot's badge. So, uh, uh, so but, yeah, this is, a, you know, this is another picture that I love. Uh, the picture on the right um, shows, um, you know, w uh, in the uh, in the middle, I think, um, you know, uh, uh, fifth from the right is uh, uh, is an Indian officer who was actually one of the first to receive a DFC in the Second World War. Uh, his name, yeah, that's the one. That's uh, that's him, Suktankar. His name is Suktankar. So he was uh, um, he was uh, he was a navigator uh, with one of the first Lancaster Pathfinder squadrons. So clearly, uh, you know, must have been reasonably good at his job. Um, received the DFC and came back to India and became an instructor at the navigation school in India towards the end of the war. So, so you had plenty of um, you know Indian volunteers in the UK. Um, I will make a. Um, uh, this is another interesting picture. It's been used on the cover of this book, which came out recently about the um, uh, about a Sterling crew. Uh, you can see that in the center is uh, or near the center there's a Sikh officer. He's also one of that first twenty four. His name's Shivdev Singh. Shivdev Singh um, also came back to uh, flew Sterlings um, in over Europe. Uh, came back to India after a tour of operations with uh, with a Sterling squadron, um, and uh, went on to become the vice chief of the Indian Air Force as an air, as a full air marshal. So he had a uh, he had a pretty good uh, record. Actually, out of those twenty four, out of that first batch of twenty four who came to the UK, um, uh, a total of uh, um, a total of seven of them became air vice marshals or air marshals in the post-independence Indian Air Force. Eight of them were killed during World War II. But of the survivors, of the 16 survivors, um, seven became air vice marshals or air marshals in the Indian Air Force. So, uh, well, you know, we, uh, so they seem like a... Uh, and like Sri, this is maybe a naive question, and I apologize for its, its, its white middle class. Um, but the RAF... British, you know, I know that I know the Indian Air Force is, is going to be, we're talking about that as well, but the traditions, they're set up, how did it work with regards the the rules of air crews, helmets, headgear, oxygen masks, because we're talking about people, beards, moustaches, turbans, headdress, religious requirements, if the, for, you know, for example, air crews have emergency rations, maybe those emergency rations have a meat they can't eat, who, who goes in? and sets those things up and makes is it is it in you know like in that that one seek in that photo there is it his duty to sort of set himself up and make sure everything's appropriate for him because or, or is there some law some rules coming down from higher up how how does that work you know i don't think um, I, I i never had the opportunity to talk to shivdev singh who's in this photograph but as i said i did um, talk to um, ms puji and uh, you know he's a wonderful person um, uh, and and he said that it was pretty much up to him, but he said that once he made a preference or a constraint um, known, he said there was plenty of support, um, you know, in uh, from all around. On his way back from India, from uh, after his tour of service in uh, in the UK, on his way back to India, he spent a, a couple of months in the Middle East, and he actually he was assigned to the pilot's pool there, and he flew for some time in the Middle East. He said the Middle East uh, it was actually much worse than the UK because. The only food that was available in some of those desert airstrips was bully beef, and he wouldn't eat that. So, um, but he was uh, in recognition of that. Uh, every weekend, he was given, a, you know, an aircraft to fly back to Cairo, and uh, you know, <laughs> sort of I'll buy his own stuff. I said, give a petty cash from the mess, and go, go just go and buy yourself whatever you need. Whatever yeah, you need. Oh, he, can you just imagine? I'm being, I'm being facetious. RAF, you know, corporals and. And, and airmen cooking meals, they're not going to be bothered about cooking for anybody with weird dietary requirements. It'd be the same as if someone said they were a vegetarian or something. Well, if it, you know, you're in the forces, you get what is served up. If you don't want what's served up, you have to provide it yourself. So I guess it's that that's how it works, isn't it? If they need something different, they're not stupid, these individuals. They have to just find a solution. Yeah. 
in those days that's how it was and you know they all uh, you know most of them uh, took it in their stride and they, you know they they uh, they lived on um, you know on on biscuit or something until until they could get get some where they could get a good meal but you know by the mid 1950s if i can just digress for a moment yeah, sure. by the mid 1950s an indian air force aircraft uh, which was flying transiting through uh, I can't remember Muharrak or in Bahrain or somewhere like that between the UK and India um landed and the crew were vegetarians and uh, they asked in the RAF mess whether um, there was any possibility of getting vegetarian food and it turned out that the the the, the cook in the RAF in the mess at RAF uh, Muharrak was a goan so so he said no problem sirs <laughs> and whipped up a wonderful indian meal for them but anyway that's uh, that's a nice no, that, those stories are great and that yeah no keep going i love it yeah. anyway so um december 1942 we've um, you know the um, uh, number 1 squadron of the indian air force has uh, re-equipped by this time with lysanders and um, in december 1942 um uh, as uh, you know uh, you know i i i know that both um, uh, james holland and um, uh, rob lyman have been um, on this program and uh, they've talked about uh, what was happening in burma december 1942 the uh, uh, the japanese who uh, you know who reached the uh, uh, the border between burma and thailand uh, a few months earlier in december 1942 they moved they started advancing into uh, into burma and both from uh, you know from the border with thailand as well as further south along the you know the tenasserim long tail of of uh, uh, of burma and uh, so number 1 squadron got its uh, first opportunity to go into action against uh, the japanese now now they were flying uh, westland lysanders and the role was um, they were originally uh, given was uh, um, army cooperation right so um, uh, you know someone who um, you know who sort of uh had uh, some staff officer who uh, emerged from the school of army flying at uh, 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 little risington or uh, wherever it was at that time uh, probably told them to go to uh, burma and be prepared to do artillery spotting and message dropping and you know, the kind of things that they'd been that the uh, that that were considered army cooperation they got to burma and looked around and they saw jungle <laughs> and uh, you know a lot of what they'd uh, you know been uh, taught uh, in army cooperation flying wasn't applicable so um Uh, look that first burma campaign from um, december uh, 1941 to about march 1942 um that was a you know it was an uh, you know uh, without uh, you know making too many bones about it it was an unmitigated disaster for the allies right? um you know the sitang bridge and uh, you know all the other uh, uh, stories are you know pretty well known but as it happens number 1 squadron of the indian air force flying those antiquated western lysanders actually did remarkably good work and demonstrated a phenomenally high spirit and they went um, uh, you know they went they actually uh, you know while everybody else was sort of uh, falling back and retreating they were, they started throwing offensive punches they modified their uh, you know the 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 bomb racks on the wheel spats of the lysander they modified them to carry heavier bombs and they went uh, uh they went and dive bombed the japanese um you know they they'd heard and read about the uh, uh the stukas in europe and the stukas uh, sirens that that the stukas had been fitted with now they didn't have sirens but what they did was they took empty beer bottles and they tossed them the the the, the gunner tossed the empty beer bottles out as they dived and the empty beer bottles made quite a satisfactory whistling sound <laughs> and uh, you know they they treated it they treated it like a party and they i mean they went there you know determined to sort of prove themselves and they did i think um, even in the you know the uh, you know dan ford the uh, the american author who writes about the flying tigers even he has written some admiring stuff about the about number 1 squadron and their uh, tubby old lysanders you know doing um, work that they were never designed to do in in burma and uh, you know he's got he's got indian characters in a couple of his novels uh, who are obviously from mm. uh, Uh, number one squadron uh, of the air force so so they did pretty well and the commanding officer of the squadron whom you see there uh, uh, on the right uh, karun krishna majumdar universally known as jumbo majumdar big built and uh, therefore uh, nicknamed jumbo uh, came back with a uh, with a dfc so uh, that's another dfc for the another of the uh, and it is it's it is good to you know you're absolutely right that period of the war in the in burma was not good for anybody um but to to highlight some things that came out of that as as being uh, 
successful i mean it's 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 worth noting you know it's worth it, the trend was that the allies were losing but within that there are some bright spots there are some lessons being learned you know and, and as Rob, robert lyman would talk about the the foundation of the success of the allies in 43 44 45 was the lessons learned in the dark days of 41 42 and the people who were in that whether they were in the air or on the ground who said here's what doesn't work here's what we need to do to work to, to, to work better and as i've said many times when we're talking about the this campaign you know british authors refer to it as being far away a long way it's not very far away if you're from india Burma is, it's not so it, it is much more that you, the indians fight than it is perhaps the if you're from aberdeen in scotland or you know uh, canada but if you're from india it's it's this is your part of the world that is under threat this is so so they have a vested interest of course in in, in what they can do to stem the japanese advance it is you know it's it's like it's in a sense it's their battle of britain isn't it when we talk about the british in 1940 defending their shores this is a similar experience if you're an indian pilot there this is sort of your battle of battle of india isn't it that's right and uh, from about april 1942 onwards it actually started getting coverage in uh, in the indian press along those lines and uh, when the japanese uh, carried out their first air raids on calcutta which were obviously on a much smaller scale than the blitz um, than london endured um, you know, during the Blitz, uh, it was actually uh, written up um, very much like um, the um, uh, in the manner that the um, mm. that Battle of Britain was, had been written up two years earlier. Uh, besides the air raids on Calcutta, um, uh, what I um, meant to convey in this uh, uh, slide was that in uh, again, as uh, uh, you know, students of that theatre will know. Uh, from March, in, in April 1942, uh, late March and um, uh, early April 1942, um, there was actually a battle at sea called the Battle of Ceylon. Uh, the first air fleet of the Imperial Japanese Navy, which is the same supercarrier task force that had raided Pearl Harbor, those same supercarriers that had uh, raided Pearl Harbor came sailing into the Indian Ocean and uh, north up the Bay of Bengal. And it was a pretty scary moment for India. Uh, some of those Japanese uh, ships did uh, uh, send a few, either send a few aircraft. Um, uh, they 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 bombed Trincomalee, as you um, uh, as you probably know, the uh, the Easter uh, raids they were called, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and they uh, they came sailing a little way up the um, uh, up the Bay of Bengal, and on the way they uh, lobbed a few shells ashore or lobbed a few bombs uh, ashore. Uh, at uh, Madras and Vijakapatnam, which are two of the uh, largest ports on the uh, uh, east coast of India, and uh, uh, there was a there was a genuine fear that they might uh, reach all the way up to uh, uh, Calcutta. And the Indian Air Force had a small role in identifying some of the detachments of the Japanese fleet flying like flying the same Westland Wafties that you see in that picture. Then that they mm -hmm. were flying back in 1932. I mean, against aircraft carriers carrying zeros, right? But uh, the, and those two uh, officers I've, whose pictures I've put up there are were actually uh, among the uh, the first crew who spotted some of those detachments. The larger, the main Japanese fleet was spotted by the Canadian pilot. I'm forgetting his name, but um, a Catalina pilot who was uh, shot down immediately after uh, sending the sighting report and became a, a prisoner of uh, war of the Japanese. For well, I, mean, I I love this kind of detail, Sri, because it's that it's that subject mass that most people watching this won't know about this you know that they'll they'll have heard of these carriers they'll have but that they would not have involved that there was a small you know indian air, air force contribution to this battle here and again it's reminding us all that every victory and every defeat that is shared by the allies is shared by all of us you know as we as we keep talking about this nationalistic approach to our study of history is that here's what my nation was doing and meanwhile, your nation was doing this. Well, in actual fact, most cases, it was multiple nations working together. And it, it, it can never be stated enough that. And I'm so glad that we are moving to an era where we are acknowledging that we're all in this together. And, and, and it's it, it, this, this, this work you've done with your book is so important to, to, to widen this story for, a, for, 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 for an audience. I completely share all those thoughts, uh, Paul. But I can see that we're, you know, we're probably three quarters of the way through our time. Oh, I don't care. I'm enjoying it. It's good. People, people enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. It's a sunny day. I'm glad to hear that. So.
So 1942 to 1943, that was a period, and the Japanese actually paused on the frontiers of uh, India. They'd reached the frontiers of India, and they actually paused. They'd probably run out, uh, you know, outrun their own, um, you know, uh, uh, supply just, chain. Yeah. Supply there. So everyone, so it was lucky for the Allies uh, that they did. So 1942 to 1943 was a quieter time, but uh, the Allies used that time well to build up, um, you know, the the, the Sinews. And, um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Rob Lyman and James Holland would have told you about what uh, General Slim did to, uh, you know, to build up the 14th Army during that period. Yeah. But the Indian um, Air Force was, uh, you know, building up too. Uh, you remember it was still, uh, the Indian Air Force had taken one year to grow from one flight to one squadron from 1932 to 1939. Then from 1939 to 1942, it expanded to three squadrons. In 1943, it grew to seven squadrons. So that was a pretty significant uh, growth. But there was a lot of other expansion taking uh, place around them uh, among the other allies as well. And one interesting figure is that during that period, 1942 to 1943, um, at the start of 1942, there were probably 10 all-weather airfields in India. By the end of 1943, they built 200 new airfields. Now, that is a phenomenal uh, building exercise. Because even in, in, in the UK, when Bomber Command was being built up at roughly around the same time, my understanding is that about 100 new airfields were constructed. But in, in India, in a Sounds about right. less infrastructure, over, I think that the figures are actually 215 airfields were constructed. Now, it wasn't entirely positive in many ways, because in many ways, the uh, in, in many cases, the land had to be, was acquired at very short notice, and whole villages were relocated. But, you know, but it, but it, it did transform the infrastructure. And, um, you know, the, the training uh, system for Indians was complete, for Indian um, and airmen and technicians uh, was completely overhauled, and a lot of the training started to be delivered in India, including training for Europeans. So training, so there were in there were European, there were uh, British and other European members of the Allied Air Forces who underwent pilot training in India, and there were a handful of Indians who became instructors in those establishments. And there's, and there's wonderful stories about some of them, and uh, you know, a big and important aspect was uh, the, uh, the participation of women. That was one of the biggest transformations of the. Uh, Second World War, the uh, the participation and the greater visibility of women. Now, there wasn't actually a women's Indian Air Force. There was a women's uh, uh, auxiliary Air Force, a women's Royal Air Force uh, in the UK. There wasn't a women's Indian Air Force, but there was uh, what is called the WAC-I, the Women's Auxiliary Corps India, which is actually an army formation, but a few thousand women from the WAC-I were deputed to the Indian Air Force, and they were used in the same kind of roles that they were used in in the um, RAF in the UK. So there was a massive transformation. I mean, I find that absolutely fascinating. When, when, when you sent me your slides and I saw that picture of the women there, because I, I just, my perception of India, even today, if I'm being really honest, is that it's not the most gender equal society, you know? You're not wrong, Paul, but, uh, you know, I think. Um, uh, uh, you're not wrong at all. It, it is not the most uh, equal of societies, but uh, we do have, you know, we've had uh, uh, women in the Indian Armed Forces for decades. Okay, again, it's, it's, this is this theme, America. sorry, of, of, the, of the fact that the services are advancing things faster than, 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 than conventional life. You could, you could make the same point about the, um, okay, the U.S. Army had segregation up until 1949, where it was beyond that integration actually moves at a rapid pace and you know you look at an aircraft carrier now in the in the u.s navy or something like that it is a multicultural society it's a it's a um so it, it is it is i think it's a, a very a very important theme that in many ways ways i say the services are the first to to integrate by necessity possibly but it doesn't matter the reason as long as it happens you know that's the yeah. yeah, I think that's true of India. Uh, I do want to make one small uh, point about you know the photograph on the bottom right, which you've also used as the. I did. Uh, I just loved it so much. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a gorgeous photograph. But you know, it's gone round on social media in the UK as well and as in India as supposedly representing Indian Spitfire pilots who flew in the Battle of Britain. Well, it's not. <laughs> it's not that. This was a photograph taken at the operations training unit in India around 1943, um, uh, around the 1943 time frame. Um, and you know, I, we've actually managed to make contact with the son of one of the pilots in that uh, uh, in that picture. Uh, this is a it's a photograph taken in India of Indians, most of whom went on to fly hurricanes in Burma. 
and uh, you know distinguish themselves uh, definitely. But uh, you know, I, I I love the idea that uh, it's it's being used to uh, you know sort of uh, demonstrate. Well, that's that thing of every, everything goes that gets a bit exaggerated. The, the story outgrows that, yeah. But it's it's still an incredible image, and yeah, it, 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 it is, isn't it? You know, they they do look very as as you said of Aspi engineer, they look very sure of themselves. Absolutely, they're they're cocky is fun. the word I was going to use. They're cocky and um and full of themselves. Yeah, no, absolutely, and and deservedly so because you know that incredible what we're talking about here so moving on you know end of 1943 late 1943 is when the allies went back into burma now i think the significance of that is in many ways uh, i think uh, uh, in in the asian theater china was uh, the, the the china was analogous to the the russian uh, to the to the soviets in europe um, china was tying down half of the japanese army on a continental scale and just as you know, during the period from you know from uh, Dunkirk until 1944, the uh, well from 1941, the start of Operation Barbarossa, from 1941 to nine, till 1944, the Soviets were the only um, country that was uh, uh, fighting the German army on a continental scale and was tying down more than half the German army. On the same lines, um, you know, China was tying down half the Japanese army, and it was important to keep China fighting. And Burma was that's why Burma was important. And Burma was the only location where Japan was still on the offensive. And as Rob Lyman has said, you know, Burma was Japan's last chance to turn the tide in at least uh, one theater. So going back into Burma was um, important. Now, the Air Force's role in Burma was very different from the European theater. Um, there are, again, there are some similarities to the Russian front, although the numbers are smaller. Their operations are mostly tactical operations. It was sort of photo recce, tactical recce, close air support, ground attack, fighter bomber work, and a lot of support to the army. So except in some limited ways in um, 1943 and early 1944, um, there were no huge mass air raids and swirling dogfights, as you see in the European theater. But there was a lot of flying, and it was mostly at low level and down and dirty and dangerous. It was risky. We lost a lot of um, aircraft and pilots to uh, um, uh, low-flying accidents and um, uh, and uh, action. And sometimes it's very difficult to tell whether they were accidents or action, because the Japanese developed ways of um, Japanese actually developed booby traps for low-flying aircraft in valleys. They'd have cables strung across the valleys with grenades on them, and oh, the aircraft could hit uh, you know hit the air, uh, hit the cable and. Uh, you know, go down, and no one would know that it was actually due to a Japanese booby trap rather wow. than a, an. And just the difficulties of flying over jungle. I know not all of their theatre is there's mountains and hills, but you know, when we talk about the, we're going to be doing a show in September about the air sea rescue teams that develop post battle of Britain. If you went down the channel and and the systems, you this is flying over terrain that is not. It's it's trying to kill you. If if you manage, I mean, what you can't crash. There's no crash landing is almost impossible. If you do crash land and survive. There's, there's, there's all the perils of the jungle. I mean, this is dangerous flight and navig just navigation. You know, it is you've not got church towers like you have in Europe, for example. Every, every, you know, in France, for example, in Normandy, if you're doing ground operations in Normandy, you've got a church tower every two kilometers or something oh, yeah. to look at. Rivers, harbors. Uh, this, this is much, much more difficult. Oh, oh yeah, I've got I've got a couple of pages in my book about the special challenges of navigation in India and Burma. But uh, you know, again, that's and of course, and a good point to mention your book. And uh, it's not on book, uh, bookshop, folks, so I couldn't put the link in below. But you can buy it on Amazon and all places where books are sold. And it's the so that, that just as soon as you finish the show, go and buy the book because it's it's a great read, and you'll be learning about something that you you didn't know much. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. So the forgotten few there. So great, great, great book. Um, so. Um, Meanwhile, back back to the presentation. I'm thoroughly enjoying it, and so is everybody else. So, uh, so you know, uh, so the, the Allies went back into Burma in late 1943. You know, there were there were a million men, not all of them in the front line, but uh, you know, there was something like a million men who went into that. About 40 combat squadrons, and uh, you know, 20 or 30 support squadrons, many of which were Dakota squadrons borrowed from the United States. And um, uh, you know, it 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 was pretty big, and uh, um, and uh, you know, they they started. Um, uh, you know, uh, that that photograph that you see there is actually uh, Lord Mountbatten, who was in November 1943, was appointed as uh, uh, the commander in chief of Southeast of the new Southeast Asia Command. Yeah. 
and um, uh, that's actually is actually visiting number six squadron of the Indian Air Force, which uh, I have a special affection for because both my father and father-in-law served with the post-independence number six squadron. But uh, again, a different Brilliant. story. So, so um, 19, late 1943, 1944, uh, the um, you know the Indian Army and Air Force went back into, and you know the Allied armies and Air Force went back into um, Burma and uh, started fighting uh, down the coast of Burma, down the Arakan coast of Burma. And about a, mo a month or two into that offensive down the Arakan coast, the Japanese launched an offensive a little further north. And, you know, the, the Burma front was divided into three fronts, which you could call the Southern Arakan Front, the Central Front, and the Northern Front. The Northern Front was mostly the Chinese um, uh, army, but uh, uh, on the center, as, as the Allies were launching the uh, offensive uh, into Burma down the Arakan, uh, uh, on the Arakan Front, the Japanese attacked with their uh, uh, their, their uh, uh, operation Hago is what they called it in Imphal and Kohima. So, as you say, as Robert Lyman said, this is their the Japanese last throw of the dice. Now this is their, their last last possible chance to do anything there because this is forty four now. They're being pushed back in the Pacific Islands. It's it's it, it's the, the tide has turned. That's pretty much the case. It was their last opportunity to to turn the tide, and uh, you know they, um, you know they 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 threw a lot into it, and um, Imphal and Kohima. Everyone knows those names now, and I think it's a tribute to um, you know British um, uh, consciousness and um, the willingness to change the uh, you know the the, the sort of uh, uh, narrative that uh, they now recognize Imphal and Kohima as as important and strategic. Yeah. Um, uh, as they are now. Uh, so as I said, there were about, um, uh, you know, there were about uh, uh, 30 to 40 combat squadrons, out of whom s uh, seven were Indian Air Force squadrons. Um, five were initially flying, five were flying hurricanes. Two were flying the American Vulti Vengeance, which you see in the bottom left uh, uh, picture over there. Now, the Vengeance was sort of, uh, uh, you know, you talk about uh, uh, caste systems. When um, uh, when RAF uh, pilots came to India and were posted to Vengeance squadrons, if you read some of the uh, the, the memoirs of RAF pilots at that time, including you know very distinguished RAF pilots like Paul Ricky, uh, you know the author of Fighter Pilot and uh, the people like that, they considered it uh, you know it it was it was a matter of shock and horror if uh, one of them was posted to a Vengeance uh, squadron. No, 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 that was uh, you know that's unacceptable, old boy. And you know it was very much at the bottom of the RAF caste system. There are letters. <laughs> Um, and uh, you know memoirs in which it uh, it, it shows up, and uh, you know then uh, you know some friend or other would uh, you know move uh, heaven and earth to have him move to a Spitfire or Hurricane squadron. But if you talk to the Indian and Australian crews who flew um, vengeances, there were two Indian squadrons which flew vengeances, and about four four or five Australian squadrons which flew vengeances in Burma. They loved it. I mean, the aircraft was robust and reliable. It, you know, you could do things with it, and it brought them home. You, it dropped bombs, uh, you know, very accurately and effectively, and it, it brought them home. And you know, they were they were pretty happy with it. Uh, the photograph in the bottom right there is um, a photograph of the, uh, you know, number one squadron was at um, uh, Imphal, and um, uh, and it was commanded um, at that time in Imphal by. Uh, squadron leader Arjun Singh, right, whom you see in the top left. Arjun Singh was in the uh, the last batch of Indians to go to Cranwell, and um, uh, he commanded number one squadron in um, Imphal and did it so effectively that uh, he received the battlefield award of a DFC. And in the bottom right photograph, you can see um, Lord Mountbatten pinning the DFC on him, while Air Marshal Sir John Baldwin is the figure on the right. He was the um, uh, the air officer commanding of RAF of the RAF in India. So, so it was um, you know it was a fairly um, it, it was a landmark year for the uh, mm. Indian Air Force. All the Indian Air Force squadrons went into action either in the Arakan or the Burma Front. And you know I you know we we all know that at the time of Imphal and Kohima they didn't get much coverage in the press. And one reason they didn't was that a lot of the key things happened at the same time as the preparations for D-Day were happening. So a lot of the concentration in the, the press in the West was on D-Day. When D-Day happened, by the time of D-Day, there were probably around 100 Indians in, uh, um, in different roles with the RAF or uh, with uh, Indian Air Force detachments in, um, uh, in, in, in the UK. And uh, these two photographs show two of them. You remember Jumbo Majumdar, who was, com who was commanding number one squadron in first Burma. So that's him 
in the uh, in the photograph on the left he actually dropped a rank by this time he'd become a wing commander in india but um, i think he'd uh, you know he'd he dealt with some um, uh, some insulting comments to the effect that uh, oh well you can't expect to understand air warfare fully because you haven't flown in europe old boy or words to that effect so he dropped rank to come to europe and he flew with um, um, uh, with an raf squadron uh, in um, uh, in um, uh, in europe uh, starting on d plus 1 he started flying over france on the 7th of uh, um, of june uh, flying mustangs and um, and um, uh, um, uh, mustangs and uh, and typhoons um, and uh, uh, the figure on the right is uh, you know the, uh, an indian who went through a very different sort of uh, uh, progression but not dissimilar to many others um, in uh, in the uk he was a student at bristol university when uh, the war started and uh, like a lot of his classmates and batchmates he he volunteered for uh, for service uh, went to the rf and was ad admitted into the rf volunteer reserve colonial subjects were all admitted initially into the volunteer reserve as uh, um, in 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 the ranks non commissioned um, air crew and so on he stayed on um, till uh, uh, till 1944 and uh, by 1944 he was flying um, um, uh, you know uh, uh, typhoons as you can see uh, over normandy and sadly he was shot down in um, in Aug he, on uh, on the very day that or the the day after paris was liberated so on the very day that uh, general charles de gaulle was leading a victory parade down the champs elysees uh, this young indian uh, uh, pilot was shot down um, over france uh, after having uh, he was on his second or third sortie of the day i've, I've got the squadron orb and mm. um, sadly was shot down in uh, you know in in on you know at that very late stage of the war and it was and his grave was actually unknown for many years and it was only about 6 uh, or 7 years ago that his grave was finally identified oh, wonderful so back in back in burma i think uh, period in 19 from late 1944 to early 9, to uh, mid 1945 you know the big counter thrusts against japan had started and the indian armed forces were uh, sort of key to those thrusts and uh, uh they they'd gone into the there'd been a thrust into burma uh which went fairly deep in, you know on the on a on a um, on a west to east axis went fairly deep into burma and then pivoted to go south and went down the valleys of the rivers uh, the objective was to reach rangoon and the the deadline was that they had to reach rangoon before the monsoon because once the monsoon set in movement would be very very difficult so the, the the army was moving as fast as it could and the air force was sort of leapfrogging from one air strip to another to keep up with them and uh, they actually reached rangoon um on uh, the 8th of may which as uh, uh, you know world war 2 uh, aficionados will know was also ve day right and uh, but the fighting was still going on at full swing in uh, mm. burma and uh, ve day was sort of uh, largely overlooked Uh, but on the 8th of may the um, the indian army and the indian air force did actually reach um, burma as, uh, did did reach rangoon as part of uh, operation dracula is what it was called then and uh, the little bit of trivia that i wanted to bring up in this uh, slide is that among the air crew flying over rangoon on the 8th of may um, uh, the the figure on the left is uh, uh, squadron leader pc lal who was commanding 7th squadron of the indian air force at that time the figure on the right is uh, Uh, group captain john granby who was flying uh, he, he was a, a hurricane pilot during the early part of the war uh, but by uh, by this stage by may 1944 he was flying a dakota over um, over uh, burma and he had a role in dropping uh, flags to the uh, the british prisoners of war who were still in the, the in rangoon jail which is uh, in, uh, the photograph which is the photograph behind him and both uh, squadron leader pc lal and uh, group captain john grandy were flying over rangoon on the 8th of may the day that they captured rangoon the interesting thing is by the 1960s both of them had become chiefs of their respective air forces mm. pc carl was uh, chief of the indian air force from 1969 to about 1972 and uh, sir john grandy everyone knows marshal of the raf sir john i don't remember the years that he was chief of the raf but it was slightly before uh, pc carl so you know connections so and uh, like many others throughout the war um uh there was an indian squadron present at the surrender of the japanese in uh, uh, in burma in rangoon uh, 
so the Japanese, um, uh, you know, uh, field marshal who who came to sign that surrender agreement is in these photographs. Uh, the Indians are not visible in these two photographs, but they were there, and they'd actually provided an escort to the Japanese aircraft. Uh, um, it was eight squadron of the RF, which of the Indian Air Force, which was flying Spitfires by then, and they helped to escort this uh, delegation in. And they went on to sign the surrender in, uh, the Japanese delegation went on to sign the surrender in uh, in this landmark building in Rangoon called uh, Jubilee Hall, which is, I think, on the next uh, slide. Um, and yeah, that's the, the picture on the left. The picture on the right is actually a photograph of the surrender ceremony. And again, the photographs below are a young Indian Air Force officer who was uh, part of number eight squadron and had been one of the escort to the incoming uh, Japanese. The figure on the right is General uh, Lieutenant General Sir, uh, uh, Sir Frederick Browning, Boy Browning of Arnhem fame. By this time, he was in Burma, and he was one of the signatories to the surrender agreement in uh, in Rangoon. So, and that's something people forget that Browning ended up in Burma. That's uh, as far as most people are concerned. His career is 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 Arnhem. That's all they know about him. But yeah, no, interesting figure. Well, you could argue that uh, you know that Burma was a punishment for him rather than a. Than a yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go against that. Yeah, it's um. <laughs> yeah, so so that's uh, anyway, so witnesses to the surrender. But by the end of uh, the, the the Second World War, I think the Indian Air Force had sort of. Uh, uh, justified it. So they they had uh, you know uh, most of the decorations. They had the they had DSOs. They had they had about twenty five DFCs. They had some a handful of AFCs. They had uh, OBEs and MBEs and everything like that. So they they had I think um, uh, proved themselves uh, you know uh, pretty much. Now one of the interesting things about the Indian involvement is that um, uh, the Indian Armed Forces had had a continued fighting role. For some time beyond uh, VJ Day, because partly because the uh, you know the the uh, J Japan surrender triggered the release of a lot of British servicemen who joined under war service conditions. So um, and that was that's a, another long story about how the uh, the British had to draw down their forces partly under compulsion um, uh, immediately after VJ Day, and the Indian Armed Forces actually had to take on some significant roles in. Um, uh, the rest of Asia, and in particular, one Indian Air Force squadron went to uh, Japan with the occupation force. They were flying these high mark Spitfires, but it was the number four squadron of the Indian Air Force. That's why the the formation showing them flying in the numeral four, and um, they they went to Japan with the occupation force. And uh, one of the interesting aspects of uh, um, of that, if you can uh, skip down a um, uh, couple of a uh, slide. Um, uh, well, well, just skip that. I think that this is, uh, there's some human interest around these. The um, the air officer commanding of the air component of the British Commonwealth Occupation Force in Japan was by then Air Vice Marshal Sir Cecil Bushier, who, as a flight lieutenant, had been the first CEO of A Flight Number One Squadron uh, of the Indian Air Force way back in 1933. So it, there is a that, that, of, and that's that you said we were going to come to him later on. It's 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 fitting that he was there at that point. There, such an important figure in the in the creation of and uh, there at the end. Amazing, amazing story. He was a uh, he he was important to the Indian Air Force and came back to India. Um, you know, long after independence uh, was you know received as an honored guest in um, you know by Indian Air Force units and made a sp made a speech which is on the record somewhere about uh, uh, his involvement in. Uh, uh, he in, interestingly in his speech he mentions a couple of other senior Royal Air Force officers who had very definitely been in the you know we want this to fail camp uh, mm. in 1933, and he said that uh, at the RAF club in Piccadilly is it uh, he uh, he said he used to meet those two um, RAF officers occasionally and they always said to him things like we did a pretty good job in raising the Indian Air Force. Do you mm. <laughs> That's like the Lawrence of Arabia story, isn't it? In the, in the film, when the the officers who who suddenly come right round to his way of thinking when it's been a success, they join they join into the success once it's been a success. It's the how many times has that happened in history? People joining, jumping on the bandwagon once it's uh, got to a certain point. Yeah, I think it has happened a few times, Paul. <laughs> Absolutely. But this is a fantastic graphic. This is the data, isn't it? I should have put it into a, into an actual uh, you know uh, graphic, but um, as you can see, you know uh, the Indian Air Force was about 250 officers and men at the start of World War II, and as you can see, by some counts, if you include the uh, you know the no the enrolled followers who actually did uh, you know they did they were an absolutely indispensable part of what the 
Indian Armed Forces did. If you include them, they were, they were you know, we were, uh, the Indian Air Force was about, a, um, grew about, by a factor of 130, not 130 percent, a factor of 130. That's from crazy. about 250 people, nearly 40,000. So there it is. And it continued to grow after independence and partition, actually, because in the, in the first few years after uh, independence, in the late 1940s and the early 1950s, both India and Pakistan were still expanding their armed forces, which very few other countries were. Just a couple of other connections. I think, you know, when I, when I talk to Britons about uh, the Royal Air Force, and the two things that they all remember are the Battle of Britain and the Dam Busters. <laughs> so yeah. um, uh, the, the, the figure on the left in, in, in this slide um, is um, the is uh, uh, James Nicholson, who was the only fighter command Victoria Cross recipient of uh, during the Battle of Britain. Uh, I don't know how many people remember it, but he actually came out to um, India and Burma and commanded a bow fighter squadron in uh, Burma in the um, in later in the war, and he actually died in a Liberator crash in the sea, where he was just flying as an observer, um, you know, uh, and. Uh, uh, the, the the liberator he was flying went down in the sea. There were a couple of survivors from that crew, but um, he was lost in the somewhere in the seas that wash in somewhere in the Bay of Bengal. So, and the, the on the right, uh, what I wanted to say was the um, uh, you know those two pictures are uh, if you know the 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 the, the dam busters uh, uh, aficionados will recognize the squadron letters. Again, you know, most of the histories of uh, 617 Squadron don't say it, but uh, 617 Squadron came out to India in 1946 and spent nearly a year in India. Um, that's a long story there, but again, I think we're pretty close to... We can do that next time. Should winding up. So, and, uh, you know, this is, these are, uh, you know, this just, uh, you know, the, 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 the economic and social and political impact of uh, the Second World War on, um, on India. I mean, the, uh, you know, it transformed the economy, it, um, you know, transformed the infrastructure, it brought women into, um, uh, into the workforce and public view on an unprecedented scale. It brought Americans, the, the middle picture in the, in the bottom row is actually, <laughs> you know, Americans in Calcutta. So it brought Americans into India in huge numbers. And um, and uh, you know, arguably, I think the Second World War con made a huge contribution to India's independence. I mean, India would mm. uh, the the independence uh, wouldn't have been there. Uh, a, a little throwback. We talked about uh, I mentioned squ uh, squad leader Arjun Singh, who got a DS, the last Cranwell from the last Indian batch at Cranwell. He came back to Cranwell three. He was invited back to Cranwell three times as reviewing officer at the graduation, uh, the passing out parade. So this is. Uh, photograph of one of those occasions. Again, I think it's a, a tribute to Cranwell as well, that they remember him and invited him back. Definitely. So, yeah. And uh, this is, you know, the top three uh, pictures are sort of uh, the Indian Air Force at the start, including us, the engineer, <laughs> again, uh, in his Wapiti. The bottom three pictures are pictures of the uh, Indian Air Force as, as it is today, including the first Indian woman to uh, qualify to fly a MiG-21. So... It's been a it, it it's been a, a amazing journey for the for Indians Air Force or now the Royal Air Indian Air Force. So, as we bring things to an end, Sri, I want to just um, uh, remind ourselves that we're talking about say South Asia history, and I, and I I think that had I tried to do this kind of program even just ten years ago, it would have been a lot harder because there just weren't the historians. Do you feel that you're part of a sort of a a boom of interest in that period within India now, and not just India, around South Asia generally, because it seems to me, because of partition, because of empire, because that period and Gandhi and all that, which is an incredibly important era in world history, not just what happened in South Asia, that was your, what you talked about for so long. And, and of course, you still do. But now there is this interest in looking back at the First and Second World War. So, so it must be quite exciting because for us, if uh, white middle class, middle aged guys, if we start writing about D Day now, we're building on a legacy of 70 years of writing about D Day. It's all been said. Well, I, you get this new book, but the point is you're a part of something new. So, how, how exciting is it to think that there is this movement now to get India's history out to a wider audience? No question, uh, Paul. It's a it's a really exciting period to be writing about uh, uh, India's role in World War II. Now, I think uh, uh, 
it's again, it's uh, it's it's sort of understandable. I, I mentioned um, a little earlier that uh, you know part of the political opposition to India's participation in World War II was because um, of the disappointments at the end of World War One when mm. India participated in World War One. Uh, India actually had a representative at the uh, signing of the Versailles Treaty, and he figures in that famous painting of the signing of the uh, of the Versailles Treaty. There was an Indian general, an Indian Maharaja, who held a general's rank in the Indian Army at the signing of the Versailles Treaty. And there were so there was an expectation that uh, you know there would be um, uh, you know more autonomy granted to India after that didn't happen, and it was really that disappointment which drove the Indian um, indigenous Indian. Uh, opposition to participation in uh, World War II, and uh, when the uh, the Viceroy of the time, Lord Linlithgow, declared uh, in, uh, you know India part of the war effort without consulting the, uh, there was a, a, a sort of a legislative assembly with Indian members at that time. He didn't consult them; he just declared war on the Axis, and the, you know that was what made the uh, you know the, the, the political opposition to participation in the war. But beneath that political position of opposing uh, you know the the the, the colonial war. I've talked to many, many participants, Indian participants in World War II, all of whom uh, consulted someone, and you know, an elder in the family, or a priest, or a you know, a pandit, or a malvi, um, and uh, uh, a teacher, a professor, about the advisability of participating in World War II. And without exception, the advice they got, including from political leaders who publicly were opposing Indian participation. Without exception, they all said, go ahead, India, independence is coming and we'll need people who've uh, been trained and experienced in, uh, in every form of, um, you know, the, uh, every part of the government. So we need this. So, uh, so behind the official disapproval, there was a tacit approval. Now, in the first few years after the first few, um, uh, the first decade or two after independence, I think the um, Indian veterans of World War II very much felt neglected. There was much more attention given to um, Indians who could be shown as having resisted colonialism. I think the real change in, in, in India started happening around 2014, when the centenary celebrations of the First World War suddenly started bringing up you know, mm. the, the involvement of uh, uh, Indian participants. And I know for a fact that in 2014, when French and Belgian authorities started to contact the uh, Indian embassies in those countries and saying, you know, we want to mark the centenary of this battle, of that battle. Uh, can you um, uh, do, you, do can you send along the, you know, the families of some of the veterans who served there? I know that in the Indian embassies at that time, the initial reaction was, what? There were Indians there. So, but I think that uh, you know, those uh, the, the scale of those centenary celebrations, and to some extent, the you, you know, the way that they were marked as. Sorry, celebration is the wrong word. The way they were marked as remembrance yeah. rather than as, uh, you know, as jingoistic events. I think that, uh, you know, sort of brought home to India as well that there was much about India's participation in those two catasclimic uh, you know, events. Yeah. No, I, I think I think we, you've made your point very well, and essentially we're going to continue this discussion on Wednesday with Kiran Sahota, who's who's a, 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 you know an English Indian about the English Indians now reclaiming their ancestral role because we're talking to you as an Indian Indian about but there's of course there's that next generation down of will you know will young British people who are now completely British who support England and the world in the Euros and what have you will they be able to connect to their Indian past as well as their British past and so sort of, and bring it all together and we'll be talking to her about the work she's doing to 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 to, to commemorate and and bring these communities together because it's it the the fact is as I as I, as I, when I watch things like um the coverage and from the cenotaph for uh, uh, Remembrance Day you do see a lot of white faces in the crowd. You don't see as the, the if you look at like Notting Hill Carnival or something, you complete, you see a swathe of London, but the cenotaph, the British Legion, you do still see a little bit of that middle England. And I'd like to see the people who've got ancestry from places like India or Pakistan or Nepal or wherever it would be, are now claiming their, connection to world war ii and we start seeing those people in the streets there as well because you know it's it's the same it's the same in normandy as well to some extent is that the people who attend the ceremonies are the people from normandy with connections to normandy 
because normally has immigrants normally has people from other as yes, they're russians living here and can we connect them to being part of this history as well because again it's all to me it's all about connecting we are all in this together and the more we can um not celebrate is the right word but, but um appreciate the fact we have these shared histories the more we can work forward together as a multicultural multicolored multi racial multi religious um uh, world a world a, a world together as opposed to individual countries but anyway i'm lecturing now too, uh, uh, Paul, and I, I, I really admire you and those in, um, you know, in the UK who are working towards it. I, I, uh, Kiran, uh, Kiran Sahota and I follow each other on Twitter, so I know a little bit of what she's doing, and uh, you know, look forward to hearing her on Brilliant. Wednesday. Well, I'll just and remind you what's coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a moment. So, just so folks, um, tomorrow um, we are with Dr. Guy Bowman talking about the Muslim soldiers at Dunkirk, who has written a credible book about that. Then we continue. Kieran Sota's coming on talking about this, what we just talked about, South Asian heroes from the UK point of view. Uh, there's another show that ha I haven't quite put on YouTube yet because I'm still waiting for information. That is where we're talking about India's Navy in World War II with, with a serving Commodore. That's why it's taking a bit longer to get permission because he's got to get permission from his bosses to come and talk about the Navy. Uh, that's going to be Friday. And then Thursday, we're uh, talking about this Operation JWIC, this attack into Singapore. So that's Southeast Asia. And if anyone is of my age group, Darren, who are that watching, if you saw that great Australian miniseries from 1989, The Heroes, with Paul Reese and other actors, that was about that raid where they stole a, 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 um, a junk and they, they took it into Singapore. Well, we're going into that story, but we're doing the proper real story, not the crappy version of the movies and the internet tales. And Lynette Silver... The Australian historian is like she is the she is the James Holland, Richard Holmes, Peter Caddick Adams of 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 Australia combined. She is one of Australia's most renowned historians. I can't wait to be speaking to her. And so lots of great shows coming up. So as usual, folks, check out what we're doing on Patreon. Uh, if you're not following Sri on Twitter, he's he's the, the, the his Twitter handle is in the description below. It's lots of information about. Um, not just India, India's wartime history, we get in, information about the Royal Indian Air Force today, lots of stories there from Sri, so that's worth following. And um, yeah, and thanks for helping me reach the milestone of 10,000 subscribers, which we hit on Sunday. In fact, 10,138 or something now. So we've actually steamed past that head, uh, that barrier. So that's really good. I really feel we're going to get somewhere with this. And I, I'm so grateful that A, you viewers will give me a chance, and B, people of, of Sri's incredible knowledge will come on and share their time with me because without without my guests it would be just me rambling on my own all the time and no one wants that so there we are so thank you very much it was an incredible presentation i knew it would be good um we you can come back on again and we'll talk about something else next time cheers everybody so i'll see you all tomorrow everybody this is paul Woodhouse for world war ii tv saying goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day thanks everybody